can I can keep it on on a hand if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I can keep. That's it. Okay. Does it work now? Better luck. It works. Okay. So hello, my name is Antti Ristimäki. I'm working for CSC. Yeah, and I, I work as a network specialist in in Funet network and. For those who don't know, FUNET is the national research and education network in Finland. Uh, so my topic is today how we have tried to automate our new IT network. <coughs> and this is one slight background for this whole whole issue. So currently we are uh, we are re renewing our backbone network uh, on on all three levels, meaning. We, we have new fiber plant and we also renew our optical transport network and on top of that the whole IT network. And uh, comparing to our old or current network, the new network is a whole different beast uh, because our old network is uh, was rather sparse from IT point of view. We had routers only in, in the most important or, or central places. Uh, but the current, the new network is um, the design is totally different. We are we are going to basically use the IT layer as the main service layer. So that means that we we are going to have uh, routers, routers in in almost every pops. So so this is more router centric network than the the old one. And uh, this means that then in practice, as the number of routers increase increases quite a lot. Uh, it means that the old way of managing the network doesn't scale anymore. Uh, the number of routers is, is not big, maybe for, for big ISPs, but for us it's still quite a dramatic uh, increase as, as we have now seven routers and we are going to have some 40 to 50 routers. So it's a big change for, for our uh, processes. And how have we managed the network in, in the old network? Uh, the old network has mainly evolved uh, by time. There's a lot of old stuff and then we have uh, one by one tried to automate some things. And um, basically we operate the old network by hand via CL CLI. And during all these years, we have built different tooling for different tasks. Uh, for example, peering filters using tools just like Susan demos demonstrated, and also some uh, specific tooling for, for example, layer three VPN, layer two VPN provisioning, and some some tools to manage common configuration elements and so on. Uh, and these uh, old tools, they have they are built using different scripting languages, different tools like. Some use Ansible, some use self-made uh, expect scripts, and so on. But the problem with the old tools is that uh, most of them only does some specific tasks, so they are not very common, or they 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 do not generalize for the whole network. And in addition to that, we have a self-made validation tool that periodically runs as a cron job and it reports all the uh, errors and uh, and uh, <laughs> unnecessary configurations and things like that to the administrators and then the configurations are hopefully cleaned up by hand if someone has time to do that and we also try to do the the old configuration a bit more modular using for example junipers to know as uh, apply groups and and uh, other other tools that are available in the in the old old routers. And one ironic thing uh, with regards to our old network is that uh, basically the old network running configurations are used as a kind of metadata or as a database for some other tools and not vice versa. And I think that is a quite a wrong approach. This is about to change in the new network. Uh, some goals why we not want to automate more things. 
Uh, one is, th is that uh, when we deploy new routers, we, we do it by ourselves. We don't have any outsourced partner to do that. And thus we want that it's as simple as possible so that basically anyone from our network team can do that. Also, one of the most important goals is that we have consistent way of configuring things, that the router configurations are consistent across the network, uh, not depending on who has configured the router. We also want that our uh, network services and connections and things are more or less standardized, so that there are no um, <laughs> not so much much variation how things are are being done. And one of the very important things, at least for me personally, is that we, uh, we have always wanted that the routers include only the necessary configuration, so that there's as less waste as possible in the in the configurations. And we have also try uh, always tried to follow this less is more principle. Uh, we also wanted that uh, if that day comes that we will have multiple vendors, uh, we will be able to implement also some other vendor routers into the new network with reasonable effort. When we started this work about one year ago, our initial uh, initial goal was that our in initial uh, I idea was that uh, we try to automate at least most of the configuration, those things that we can automate, and then all the rest is just made by hand or uh, by some other other way. But pretty soon we noticed that when we try to deploy the new network, we run into the issue that when if we have partially automated and partially uh, manually configured network, it's pretty pretty difficult to live with with that kind of configuration because those <laughs> automated and manually added configurations might conflict quite easily. And then there's al also the big issue how to make sure that the configurations don't include anything that is not needed, meaning that if we have partially manually maintained configurations, we need some other garbage collection tool to take out those configuration elements that are not needed in the in the network. And further, if we would accept manual configurations, I think it means that by time, the quality of the configuration will erase, I'm pretty sure, because the configuration will uh, fill up with unneeded elements and so on. So we decided to take quite an ambitious goal to try to automate the whole network, so that the whole configuration is always automated. And this is this is what we actually are now doing. This means that when we build up the whole configurations automatically, we know that the configuration contains only those things that are needed, nothing, nothing more, nothing less. We don't need any separate tools for, for cleaning up the configurations. And the nice things thing is also that if someone tr uh, tries to be a CLI magician and does some manual, manual things, those will be destroyed by the automation tool. So there's no more room for manual uh, kind of wild hacks. And this is possible now that we are building the new network from scratch, basically. Although our router vendor is the same in the old and the new network, and even, even if there was temptation to just copy the configurations to the new network, we still decided to build the new network configurations from the scratch. Okay, about the tools we use. Uh, we really didn't have too much choices because we have used Ansible for uh, mainly for server automation for years and it is the tool that we are familiar with. So we, without actually without looking 
for any other tools, we decided to use Ansible also for router automation because learning some totally new tools would, would have been too much overhead for our quite a little team. And having Juniper based network, this was possible pretty easily because Juniper has a very good support for Ansible. They have their own, own uh, Ansible modules and so on. So it was pretty fast to jump into the uh, Ansible world with regards to Juniper, Juniper configuration. And we use Jinja 2 templating for generating the router configurations. Uh, but I would like to emphasize that in our use, the Ansible is basically only a templating engine. So we don't use that much any Ansible specific kind of, for example, Juniper tasks or anything. So it's basically only a templating engine that generates a text file configuration that is then uh, loaded to the routers. And if, we if the need arise, we could pretty easily to decouple these so that we use Ansible only for the for generating the configuration and then some other tool to actually deploy the configuration. So uh, at least I consider that we are not locked in to, to Ansible, but, but currently Ansible plays quite a big role in our automation. Uh, about the data model we use, this is uh, kind of invented here, data model. We are not using any, any standard or well-known uh, data model. And the reason is quite simple. It's uh, that we, s we wouldn't have time to learn, for example, open config data model. And also the fact that, as far as I know, the standard data models are very limited in terms of what features they support. So. I think that our own data model would have been needed anyway. So we, we started to build our own data model and it has gone through a lot of iteration, sometimes even daily, uh, at especially in the, in the beginning of, of this uh, new network rollout. We made quite a big changes even, even during, for example, <laughs> within the same day. But currently it's quite stable data model. Uh, we have, I have some examples here. Here, I'm not going into, into the details, but you, you can get some idea of how we define things. These are only a subset of, of things that we define. And we, in the data model, we, uh, we have the principle that the person who wants to provision some service or connection or whatever, uh, he or she doesn't have to define everything in the, in the, in the variables, but many things have a default value. Good example is interface MTU that have a has a default value unless one wants to override it. And there I have some more examples. I'm not going going to this more in detail. You can watch them in the, in the slides. But um, one thing that I think it is quite cool is that I think this doesn't show in the on the screen. But um, there are some references to, for example prefix list, like in this PGP policy, and also in the firewall filter definition. Uh, and the idea is that if we reference some object in some, uh, like in PGP group, group configuration, then the template is such intelligent that when it builds up the configuration, it picks up all those elements that are referenced in some other, uh, other uh, element. So, for example, in this example, we have we are accepting prefixes for the 2020 test lab list, and we can define that prefix list centrally in, in one place, and then it's populated to those routers that references it. Okay. Uh, in addition to daily operations, we also use the this automation framework or tool for kind of zero touch provisioning or minimal touch provisioning. Uh, as I said earlier, we have 
quite a small team and we have routers all over the Finland almost and it means that <laughs> we simply cannot waste a lot of time to provision individual router so we sp or I spent a lot of time to build up a tool that makes it as simple as possible and as we need out of band access to our core routers anyway we are now using also the out of band access to initially provision new routers with Ansible and the idea is that when we have a new router we log in to that through this out of band access to ser serial console and then do only a couple of configuration commands to get the router reachable through the management ethernet ethernet connection and then we run the ansible playbook uh, via that backdoor management ethernet so it's a uh, pretty nice nice to get the router initially configured meaning that when we provision new routers we basically need remote hands only to do the physical part of the installation and with regards to Ansible by the way I'm not going to Ansible in detail because this is not Ansible presentation but those who are familiar with Ansible might know what, what those lines mean there but basically when we do the initial commissioning we tell the Ansible with that special variable that instead of trying to reach the router in band it uses the out of band access this is defined only when doing the initial commissioning after that we normally use the in band SSH access if the router is reachable okay and uh, one result of this automation thing is basically our network database or metadata or how to how do you want to call it now lies in yaml text files so it basically acts as a database for our whole network at the moment uh, i don't know if that's going to be forever that way we hope that someday we can use some real database to get the data for example service now or some other other tool but uh, using text files was was maybe the, the easiest way forward because they are they are easy to edit and, s and easy to use with with ansible so currently we use use those uh, by the way i don't know i think that most of you know yaml format but for those who don't know it's a quite a nice format in a way that it's uh, machine readable but still very human friendly at least when comparing to XML or some other other format so it's a it suits pretty well this purpose so the network is defined in the YAML files and uh, for each router we have a router specific YAML definition that contains the configuration for that given router and in addition we have some shared files like the prefix list file that I mentioned earlier and also files for defining firewall filters polishers the PGP communities and things like that so those elements that might be needed in multiple routers are defined only in one place and that is I think that is very beautiful beautiful thing that one can def define uh, same thing is defined only once and when building up a configuration for a individual router the configuration is then composed from these different sources as I said only the necessary elements are picked up to the configuration for each router <coughs> one big thing at least it in my opinion is that once we once we have automated the network configuration this enables a lot of other things too uh, one at least in our context one very relevant factor is that now that 
the configuration is automated. When we consider, for example, which technologies to use, how to configure things, I have some examples, for example, discussion whether to have IPGP full mesh or reflectors. Uh, after we have, after the configuration is automated anyway, uh, I think that the configuration intensiveness or the configuration complexity is not more a relevant factor because it's automated anyway. So when we, uh, we are thinking what technologies to use, uh, we can focus on the technological part and not worrying about how to configure things. And this also enab enables us to use the router devices up to their full potential because many things are pretty hard to configure unless you are a very top level specialist. So uh, without this automation, we would have implement much simpler, simpler network than what we are now able to do. Of course, it's not the it's not the primary goal to make the configuration very complex. But anyway, I think it's a little bit shame if you have to uh, stop using some things just because they are too configuration intensive. Uh, okay, I, I have one example about quality of service thing. I'll, I'll come back in the next or next slide. And we also use this. Uh, this Ansible tooling for generating other uh, other uh, tools too. Uh, for example, con uh, monitoring is an obvious example. And basically, when we uh, when we configure our routers, our Nagios monitoring is always regenerated if needed. So it means that whenever we touch the network configuration, our monitoring is always up to date. And I think it's very cru crucial to have the monitoring reflect the live network. And uh, we al also have some mostly statistical views that are, that are built using the Ansible vari variables. But the point is that once the network is modeled in the machine readable format, it is very trivial to build new tools on top of that. There's just some screenshot from, from a tool that we have made on using this Ansible data. It doesn't look so uh, complex, but without, without having this uh, network metadata data in, in a YAML format, this would ha have been much more difficult. But now it's very straightforward to do whatever <coughs> is needed. In this specific example, we have a... We have a <laughs> interface statistics uh, kind of web interface and from that we have automatic references to Grafana dashboard and then the Grafana dashboard contains all the relevant metrics that we are collecting. Uh, okay and now I'm coming coming to that quality of service example I was previously talking about. And now in the new network the routers don't have low speed native interfaces anymore. And it means that we are aggregating 1G and 10G interfaces through a switch. Uh, and we also extended this Ansible to cover the aggregation switches. And basically, when we have to provision a new customer connection through an aggregation switch, the aggregation switch provisioning is simple. It's very simple. There's an example. In most common case, it's enough to just define an interface and maybe some description if one wants to, and then the rest is being done automatically. We also have a specific <laughs> Ansible template for generating the aggregation switch configuration, and the template generates all the relevant queuing, queue tunneling, and uh, all the uh, layer two learning domains. And the cool thing, at least in my opinion in, in this, is that when we configure a router interface, uh, 
the router Ansible template also reads the switch variables and uses that information when provisioning the router interface. And this way we are able to do automatic magically uh, queuing and shaping at the router interface at the right speed. And the basic idea is that we have the switch is very dumb. It has only a minimal configuration, no QO QoS specific configuration or anything. And with this we can make sure that the switch should never receive XS traffic that it can forward without queuing. So at least myself, I, I find this, this ve very cool. Uh, for those who are operating maybe a subscriber network, this might be self-evident, maybe, I don't know. But for us, this is a big thing because we have limited human resources to do things. And if all this had to do by hand, it would be far too, con uh, far too uh, configuration intensive and also error prone. Okay, some words about our migration to this new network. Now that we are managing the new network tot in a totally new way, it means that when we are migrating our customers to this new network, we have to convert the existing services to use this new YAML, YAML data model. Uh, actually, the mechanical part of writing the definition file is, is not the hardest thing. And we have actually written some very simple scripts to help the manual typing. But maybe the hardest part is how to model different things. Uh, things like normal IP access and maybe some layer 2 VPN pipes are very s trivial because they, they are usually implemented in the same way. But then there are a lot of services that have a lot of variance, for example, layer 3 VPNs that may might have different routing policies, different route leaking policies, and things like that. So those are very difficult to model or to decide how to model this in a kind of generalized way. But when we have been doing these migrations, we have simply, uh, we have done our best to normalize or standardize all our services. And myself, I, I think that although it takes a lot of effort to do that, I think the result is really worth it because then all the connections and services are kind of standardized. And having a rather small team, uh, it's very important to have standardized and kind of generalized services to manage them, to manage them well. But <coughs> especially in our case, because we are research and education network, there might be and there will be exceptions. There, there will come some needs that are not easily implemented using this tool. So at the moment we have uh, we have implemented this in a way that if there is some custom special need that is not supported by the Ansible tool, one can just write in uh, just normal router configuration, for example in our case Sunos configuration, and then that configuration snippet is automatically incorporated into the Ansible generated configuration. But this is needed only as a temporary solution until that specific case has been uh, implemented in the Ansible template. Uh, actually, at this very moment, we have zero custom configurations. But anyway, this has been implemented when the need arise. I always prefer that or recommend that if there comes a custom need, unless one is in a very hurry, I recommend that it one tries to implement it into the template so that 
it can be generalized also for some other purposes or some other use cases. Uh, <coughs> and this is actually my last slide. This is some random thoughts, maybe lessons to that we have learned. Uh, we have noticed that uh, there's quite a steep learning curve when initially starting to use Ansible. It depends on how familiar people are with that tool, but especially on the network side, people haven't used that much Ansible because Ansible has been mostly used for, for server things, at least in our company. So there are some things to new things to learn. How to how to use Ansible, how to run playbooks, how to develop Ansible playbooks and templates, and also some some basic things like SSH key forwarding and things like that. So small challenges every now and then, but it requires that people are ready to learn new things. And one challenge is also that previously people were allowed to write router configuration directly. They knew and they know how to write Zeno's OS configuration, but now they have learned totally new way to define things. And it might be frustrating for someone who is doing it only now and then. So it might feel that the over his overhead is bigger than the benefit. But in a large scale, the benefit is obvious. And also uh, one thing that uh, I have come across is that uh, it seems that people tend to kind of outsource the res responsibility to this tool. And that is not the purpose. Uh, I have always said that this is only a tool. Its, uh, its purpose is to reduce the time to take to add things to configuration and to uh, reduce risk of errors. But still, the administrator that is configuring the router is responsible about what he or she is going to do. So I always say to our, our administrators that you shouldn't outsource the responsibility. You should always check what the tool is about to do and then look that the diff output is reasonable and only after that implement it, unless you are very sure about what you are doing. And all this also requires some new skills because <coughs> this puts bias, uh, bias more to the kind of uh, software developer skills instead of kind of traditional networking skills. And that might easily become a bat bottleneck. For example, if there's some something that needs to be done with the template and one doesn't know how to do it, <coughs> and then the only, only person who is maybe, maybe in some conference in Tampere, Tampere or somewhere else is away, then it might become a bottleneck. So it might be challenging. But as I said, we are in our company, we are using Ansible quite a lot nowadays. So we do have quite a many people who are able to write templates and fix Ansible playbooks. And uh, one lesson learned from practice, or actually I don't know if I can set, set, say that this is learned because we are facing this quite often, o almost daily, is that we use, we are not our group is not kind of, um, we don't have any background in uh, software industry, but we still try to use version control. And it's ver very often that uh, we face a situation when someone has committed configuration to the network, but hasn't yet committed the change into the our, our central repository. So there might be some conflicts. Those are easily worked around, but might cause some Transient, transient frustration every now and then. Oh, I forget, forgot to mention one thing. One challenge that I haven't yet completely uh, decided is how to document all these things. 
now that we have our own data model or own way of defining things the challenge is how to document it so that someone who is doing it for the first time knows how how should I define for example how do I configure an interface using this new tool currently we work around it by having an example file I don't know if it's enough in a long run but that is our solution at the moment yeah that was my last slide I thought that some demo would be nice but I think it's impossible to do it here if there's any so are any questions thank you very much um, we have one question. Anyone else with questions? <coughs> Here's the queue. <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, your this presentation uh, talked about using Ansible for uh, all the switches and routers and stuff. Are you also using it for servers of some sort? Yeah. And are you able to reuse things like access control list definitions for both routers, switches, and servers? Mm. No. But is that because you don't want to or because no. you cannot? <laughs> Maybe we just... I think uh, basically they should could be able to use, but um, those are so different kind of playbooks and templates that uh, it will take some effort to migrate them partially. Yeah, yeah. Because but uh, good point. Yeah, I've I've been sort of planning to do pretty much the same thing, uh, and one thing that I was really looking forward to uh, is like having an access list or or a prefix list that lists all my address space or all trusted networks, and then I could use that yeah. in several different places in different th kinds of playbooks. Yeah, actually, I lied to you because we oh do have do. we do have some common, for example, SSH public keys are the same that are used in servers and then push to right. routers. Yeah. yeah. And do you who uh, do you use SSH uh, certificate or key authentication in the that's yeah, yeah. yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. There are Hi Mikko Lehto, Kuma Communications. Uh, you mentioned you are doing full configurations reloads. Mm, yeah. So how do the different brands or models of devices handle that? Any funny lockups you have been experiencing or something like that? Yeah. I don't know, <laughs> but actually when we had the procurement for this new network, we had uh, one requirement. One requirement was that the router must support loading an entire configuration as a kind of atomic operation. But how that works in practice, I don't know. Currently we are happy with the current vendor. It works pretty well. And to be honest, of course, when we have built this, built this system, we have built it uh, from the assumption that we now have this uh, vendor J. But yeah, we also have a the same principle has been used. We are now building our new data center fa fabric using totally different switch vendor. And we also try to use Ansible for that with some success. But yeah, I don't know if I even answered your question. <laughs> Okay, so no unexpected. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. But Thanks. with this specific vendor. Yeah. Any more questions? Please come up. Uh, well, do you no, no. For the it's, it's it's for the webcast. <laughs> it's not for us. It's for everyone else who couldn't <laughs> be bothered to come, <laughs> or couldn't come, or <laughs> has flu. Yeah, I'm Heikki from NetPlaza, so mm. uh, great presentation and great system. How do you deal with the uh, version uh, incompatibilities, hardware and software? Do you always standardize by some version, all the routers? And do you also do the upgrades while you are doing dealing with the automatic configuration? Do you yeah, do also those automatic? Good question. We have faced actually some incompatibilities. For example, there are routers with different versions and then some newer, newer version might support some syntax that is not supported in a, in an older version, and currently we uh, fix it by uh, when we have the template. It dynamically actually uses some information from the mm. running router. For example, uh, 
software ver version. And also, it also uh, pulls the router hardware information. We have different, we have Juniper MX204s and MX10Ks. And actually, it's the same template looks as if. If the router model is MX10K, then do something. If it's MX200, then do something. This is the way that That's we have. That's quite clever, nice. Yeah. But uh, I'm pretty sure that when we upgrade further, there might, uh, might come new incompatibilities, but I think they can be resolved using this same principle. Have you considered, or are you already uh, doing also the software upgrades no, with no, this no system? No, no, no. Okay. No. 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 <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Thanks a lot. But there's one question. Yeah, Ari Saloma from Adva Optical Networking. Hi. So I have a slightly different question from a completely different angle, looking at the bigger picture of the network. So uh, Adva is currently building, well, Funets is building based on Adva technology, the optical backbone for the whole Finnish uh, network at the moment. Mm. So my question is related to that. What kind of expectations do you have about the automation, looking at combining all the different levels of network in a neat way going forward? Uh, <coughs> well, on the, on the slides and on the papers, it's it looks that uh, it's easy to kind of do some interfaces or some interaction between different layers. For example, uh, between optical and the IP layer, that there's some orchestration, or what is the right word for that, but anyway. But um, at the moment, we are not holding our breath for that. We try to do part by, uh, part, by part then maybe that's for some future development. If you need the integration between optical and IP layer. Uh, yes, that was yeah. the point. So yeah. something to work on still. Yeah, Good. yeah. That is not very actual topic right now, but okay. maybe one day, yeah. yeah. But actually, I want to say that you, you know it pretty well, but we also require that the optical layer supports certain interfaces that at least in here is there are relevant uh, application interfaces that might be used in the future. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll have a talk about those during the coffee yeah. break then. All right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Last call. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Great talk. <laughs> so next up is Christian who's going to talk to us about the new public Telio 